Thanks, Hannah. Uh, can we also give a hand to all our volunteers, all our serve team members, everyone who has been serving, especially those in that room up there who we can't see. Thank you for serving. Uh, and if you feel like my face is a bit, uh, like I'm stoning today, I'm not, it's because of the rocks behind me. <laughs> We're taking a pause uh, from our Judges and Ruth series uh, to prepare for the most e important event in Christian history. So this is Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday happening on the last weekend of March where we mark the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to take a look into the final week of Jesus' life, particularly from the period that he entered Jerusalem to the final moments before he was arrested and crucified. And today's message, we're covering a famous scene uh, that most Christians would know or call Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. So the title for today's message is From Humility to Glory. From humility to glory. And the big idea is this, Jesus is the king we need. Jesus is the king we need. You know, I've been thinking uh, lately, what exactly do people want? What exactly do you want? So I wanted for us to just take a moment right now to think, what exactly do you want? What is something that you really, really want in your life Right now, can you just do me a favor? Just turn to the someone beside you and just share. What's that one thing? What's that something that you really want in your life right now? What is that thing? Some of you will be telling me to go for dinner. Yeah, I'm sure. What is that? What is that one thing that you really, really want? And I'm sure some of us might be sharing things like, oh, I really want to go to that place, man. I want to go to that, that holiday destination. Maybe others will be, I want to get that, like Brother Aaron, that latest pair of shoes. Some of you, you might be thinking, what I really, really want is some, some company. Maybe others will be thinking, as long as I get, can get some better friends, that will help a lot. Some of you might be thinking, I really want to get into that particular school or that particular course. Maybe others might be thinking that better job or career progression. You might want different things in your life. All of us have different things that we want. And right now, I want you to shift and think about what is it that you truly need in your life right now? What is that thing that you truly need in your life? Whether it's for yourself, whether it's for your family, whether it's for people that you know of, what is it? that's most needed at this point in our lives. Because the truth is this, there is a difference between what we need and what we want. See, what we want may not necessarily be what we truly need. And while we may know, we, while we may know what we want, sometimes we may not even know what we need. There's a clear difference between the two. And so this is what happened with the people of God. In the following passage that we're about to read, when they, what they wanted from Jesus did not measure up to what they truly needed in Him. So we read from Luke chapter 19, verse 28. It says here, And when He had said these things, Jesus said, He went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And verse 29, When He drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, He sent two of His disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering, you will find a colt tied, which no one has ever set, ever yet set. And untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and, and found, those who were sent, uh, went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. I'm going to pause here first and ask this question, what's with this donkey? What's with this cult, also known as a donkey? Why did Jesus have to borrow this donkey? What is happening right here? And in order to get a better picture, we must first understand that the New Testament is tethered to the Old Testament. See, whatever is written in the New Testament is often a reflection and fulfillment of what happened in the Old. The New Testament and Old Testament are connected and centered on the story of Jesus Christ. And up to this point, you have noticed that Jesus was always discreet about His ministry. 
especially when it came to, to healing people or miracles that he performed. Most of the time, he would be telling those who were healed to keep it to themselves, to be quiet about it. Jesus did not want the attention because the time was not right for him to be revealed yet. He would tell his disciples things like, the time has not yet come. However, all of this changed at this point in Luke chapter 19. You see, here we see Jesus going public, giving instructions to his disciples to go and look for that donkey that called to untie it so that he can enter Jerusalem on it. This was a time for Jesus to be revealed. On top of that, Jesus never really rode on a donkey. It was never recorded publicly at, at this point. He was never riding on any donkey. He was always traveling by foot or, or by boat at the Sea of Galilee. So why a donkey out of this blue? And worse, why use it to enter Jerusalem? Didn't Jesus know that the religious Pharisees all wanted him to die? Why was he walking into their trap right here? So allow me to give you a bit of background to help us understand the significance of this very moment. See friends, this exact time and week that Jesus knew uh, would lead to the very purpose why he came onto this earth. This, this, this was the exact time and week for him to die for the sins of the world. See, there was something significant about this final week of Jesus, also known as the Passion Week before his crucifixion. This week was the week for the Jews leading up to the Passover. A time where Jews from all over the world would gather in Jerusalem to observe this important feast to remember what God had done when He delivered them many years ago from slavery in Egypt. And this happened to be the month called Nisan. And no, it's not the cars that you see on the road, not the month for Japanese cars to go on the road. It's this month with Nisan, one S. It's, it's where it's found in the Jewish calendar where on the 10th day, every Jewish family was to go look for a spotless lamb to be prepared for sacrifice on Passover. And this was the exact day, the 10th day of Nisan, that Jesus was entering Jerusalem on a donkey. So what does this mean? See, in other words, Jesus represented that lamb without blemish that was prepared to be slain to save the world. Because in a matter of days, he will become the very sacrifice for the sins of humanity. So the next time you are on the road, you see another car brand called Nissan, I want you to remember what Jesus has done for you, that he was the Passover lamb that sacrificed for our sin. Turn to your friend and say, Nissan. Remember that every time you see a Nissan car on the road. See, the next thing is this. It was interesting how Jesus got, on this, got this donkey to, to ride on and the significance of this donkey. The detail, if you read the passage of tying and tying that was mentioned about five times, points to an echo in Genesis 49 verse 11, where the promise of a coming ruler would tie the donkey to a vine. See, this whole thing pointed to Christ's kingship as prophesied. The second thing is that the way he managed to get this donkey pointed to his lordship over all of creation. Just as the disciples were told to respond to the owners if they were to ask, why are you taking this? They were to respond, the Lord needs it. See, this is similar to how a king was able to claim ownership over whatever that was within his kingdom. See, while the idea of a ruler with a cult would represent a king that had everything, our Lord Jesus was a king that rode a borrowed donkey. So coming back to the passage, we continue. It says here in verse 35, And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the, uh, on the colt, they set Jesus on it, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he, they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, please rebuild your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And the first thing I want you to note about this is that Jesus was not the king they wanted or expected. Jesus was not the king they wanted or expected. Why? Because Jesus came as a humble king. In that time, a king would naturally be surrounded by his army as he entered any place. 
This entry would be a big and loud one to showcase the power and might of that king. Similar to today's world, where you, you will notice presidents or royalty with huge entourage traveling with them. If they were to come in right now into our city, you would see like, like what, eight motorcycles, six SUVs, police cars, uh, 10 bodyguards running by the side, one limousine in there with their president. It would be a grand and heavily guarded entry. But unlike any of that, Jesus chose not to enter with a war horse, which would have been more appropriate for a king. Instead, he came on a humble donkey. Why? Because Jesus is this servant king. And he's here not, not just for certain groups of people, he's here for everyone. From the highest in society to the least and the lonely, Jesus is here for all of us. And we witness this humility of Jesus, the Son of God, right from his birth, where he was a baby wrapped in a manger, to now this entrance as a king on a humble donkey. See, this whole scene was actually prophesied earlier in the Old Testament in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9. We read here, Zechariah 9 verse 9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. See, this humble entry on a donkey represents a king that came to rule and bring peace to the nations. Jesus chose to de define and declare his kingship in terms of this passage here in Zechariah 9, as this meek and humble king. He came to conquer in a way that's very different from where other earthly kings would. See, while arriving with humility on a court, the passage ends here with glory as a king. He will rule from sea to sea to the ends of the earth. And this would exactly be how Jesus' life would be on earth one day. He will go from humility as the servant king that gave his life for humanity to glory as the king of kings and the savior of the world. See, but we realize soon that neither the, the, the Pharisees nor the people knew what they needed in a king. Because first we see that Jesus was not the king the religious wanted. He was not the king the religious wanted. We see the Pharisees here that they were known as the religious elite that had great authority and influence. They knew what was happening. This whole image, this scene where Jesus was entering on a humble donkey the people rejoicing and, and shouting directly from this messianic passage in Psalm 118, affirming Jesus' identity as the king. This was precisely why the religious people tried to ask Jesus to stop others from proclaiming his kingship. They were thinking to themselves, how can this man be our king? How can the people declare this person as king? Who is he to be our powerful or political king to rule over us? To them, this man was a heretic, an enemy, because he was challenging their secured positions as the religious rulers. They did not want this king that the people were declaring to rule over them as their leader. They were afraid, knowing the number of people that were starting to follow Jesus because of his work. And this was the very reason why they wanted him dead. So the first was Jesus was not the king the, the religious wanted. The second part in this passage we notice is Jesus was not the king the rest expected. Jesus was not the king the rest expected. Why? Because the rest of the people there, they were just rejoicing at his entrance. They gathered to receive and welcome Jesus and they rejoiced with a loud voice. They cried out, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting directly from Psalm 118 verse 26. And while they were declaring these things in their excitement, in just a matter of days, some of these people would eventually become the very ones joining the crowd to cry out, crucify him. Why? Why did this happen? If you look at other gospel accounts, actually in the gospel of John, just a, a few weeks back or a short while back, Jesus did one of the greater miracles of raising Lazarus from the dead. And John would record that crowds wanted to gather to meet Jesus because of what had happened. And so here we see a huge crowd that came. And as the people cry out, blessed is the king 
who comes in the name of the Lord. They were expecting this king to finally come and deliver them from the Roman oppression, to free them from their suffering and to bring peace to their land. But just like how the disciple Peter at one point was able to declare, you are the son of the living God, you are the Messiah. Yet in the very next moment, he would rebuke Jesus when Jesus said, I need to suffer and be killed. The same it was for the people when they were expecting Jesus to be the king that they would that would bring them peace and stability. Maybe they're thinking, finally, finally we will be free from any foreign rule or, or, uh, and, and we can finally live our own lives and be our own people. They were hoping that this king would be their practical problem solver and bring an end to all their struggles. However, whether it was the religious that rebuked Jesus or the rest of the people that rejoiced over him, The truth is that ultimately, in a matter of days, Jesus was rejected as the Messiah and King when he was sent to be crucified. And even as the Pharisees tried to get get him to rebuke his disciples, you know, they were telling him, hey, please stop your disciples, stop your people from crying out about you. Stop it, stop it. It's not right. Jesus answered in Luke 19, 40. He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus was actually about to start a rock concert right there. Let it, let, at 1 a.m., some of you will realize that. See, in, what does this passage mean? It means that creation itself cannot deny its creator. That nature participates in the witness and celebration of, our, of what God is doing. See, the disciples were marking this significant moment with this messianic phrase, praising Him and saying, uh, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. But even if they were to be silenced, the rocks would soon cry out and praise the creator. And the challenge is this, friends. If rocks and stones can cry out to the, respond to the, the crea- to the creator, how much more us being made in God's image that it is only appropriate for us to give him what he deserves as his images, as his creation, to proclaim him as our king. So what does this mean for all of us? This means that we need to recognize that Jesus is the king we truly need and not the king we expect him to be. We need to recognize that he is the king that we truly need and not the king we expect him to be. You see, Jesus' identity as king is not defined by our expectations over him. Whether he is the political or warrior king that will rule as the religious were fearing about him, the question is, whether we have allowed our life's experiences to limit Jesus as king of our lives. More often than not, we have come before God and laid our expectations over Him. We expect Jesus to be our problem solver, to solve the problems in our lives on our terms. Yet Jesus never promised that, he, that we would live a life of, free of any problems. In fact, Jesus promised us that we will be receiving suffering, we will experience pain and suffering. He told us that we need to remain and take heart to remain in Him because He has already overcome the world, which means that He has given us whatever is needed for us to face the trials, the challenges, the struggles in our lives because He has overcome. He didn't promise that you'll be a problem-free life. And maybe some of us, we expect Jesus to show up the way we expect Him to be. Maybe you're thinking, Jesus, I want you, you know, I've been praying about this for the longest time. I, I, I'm praying for that closed door, that open door, the closed door, the open door, for this job, for that job. I've been, why, why are you not showing me? Well, Jesus, I, I want this, I want this job, I want this, I've been praying for this promotion. Or oh, Jesus, I've been asking you for that partner. You know, everyone else is, around me has been swiping right and getting it right, but I, I, I haven't, I, I've only got left only, left, left out. And we be coming to God with our problems and saying, no, oh, Jesus, I need, or maybe some of you are thinking, oh, Jesus, I've been trying to hustle. I see all these YouTube videos. They're telling me I need seven, eight, nine, eleven side hustles. I need to start my sub stack right now so that people can subscribe to me. I need to do all these things because I want this money. Jesus, I need you to help me, please. And we come to Jesus with all our problems and expect him to do it the way we want him to resolve our issues. Friends, I want to challenge us today. What if Jesus needed to work something in you rather than for you? What if Jesus wanted to do something in your life then do something for you? Maybe there's something in your life right now that he needs to resolve before he sets you up for something else that he wants to purpose for you. Instead of giving us what we need, uh, what we expect him to do, 
Maybe Jesus didn't give you that job because he was protecting you from something toxic or something worse. Maybe instead of getting that partner so quickly, Jesus is trying to protect you and, and prepare you to be the right person for someone else. Maybe some of us, instead of asking Jesus, say, can you help me with, with my hustle and all my these things? Maybe he's trying to teach you how to steward faithfully the little that he's given to you first. Maybe Jesus is trying to give us a deeper purpose in what he has created us for. See, we need to recognize that Jesus is the king we truly need and not the king we expect him to be. He's the king we truly need and not the king we expect him to be. So we read on in the passage next that the people start to proclaim Jesus as king. But instead of rejoicing over this celebration, our Lord Jesus Christ wept. We read here in verse 41, it says, and when he drew near the city, He's, and he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your, when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you on every side and tear you down onto, onto the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The second thing that I want you to understand from this is this. Jesus was a king they truly needed but rejected. Jesus was a king they truly needed but rejected. See, there are two occasions recorded in the Bible where Jesus wept. The first one was found in the shortest verse in the Bible. Some of you need to memorize scripture. Start with John 11.35. It just says, Jesus wept. John 11.35. And this is the scene where Lazarus had died and he was about to raise him from the dead. But the Greek translation for wept there meant shed a tear. Shed a tear. However, in Luke 19 verse 41, the Greek word for wept here represents loud wailing and sobbing. Can you imagine this scene? People are cheering, oh, oh Hosanna, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. They were cheering for him and yet Jesus, instead of receiving and celebrating this coronation, he began to lament and to weep loudly over what he saw. What was Jesus weeping about? He was weeping at how people had no idea who he truly was. They had no idea that this was the exact moment that the Old Testament prophecies were all pointing to. The arrival of the Messiah, their King. They did not know the time of His visitation. Jesus was weeping over the spiritual blindness because this was a city, a nation that He loved and cared for that had the opportunity to return to God. He wept over what was about to happen because in a few decades from His time, the city of Jerusalem would literally be flattened to the ground. Because in 70 AD, Jerusalem was invaded by the Roman Empire, Empire General Titus, who held them in a siege where hundreds of thousands of people died. And the temple walls, the stones were destroyed and removed. And even till today, if you, some of you had a chance to travel to Jerusalem, you go to the Western Wall, you see a whole rubble of stones left there from 70 AD to remind the people what happened since then. See, Jesus wept over their rejection of him as king and over the destruction that was about to come. Luke 19.42 says, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Jesus wept over them saying, Would you have known if only you knew? If only you knew the things that would have made for peace. What is this peace that Jesus is talking about? The peace described here is not a peace from, from war or peace from removing enemies. It's not a peace from living free from problems. This peace refers to a peace with God. The peace in the, that the world cannot give as, as Jesus described in John 14, 27. A peace that brings full restoration, wholeness and completeness with God. See, Jesus didn't come as the military or political king to free us for that moment or for that event. He came as a humble servant king to take our place on the cross and to pay for the penalty of our sin. And that's the beauty of the, and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the gospel is, is summed up in this sentence that Timothy Keller said, said one time. It was so good. He said this, sin is when a servant chooses to take the position of the king. Salvation is when the king chooses to take the position of the servant. This is what the gospel is all about. That our king would come 
and take the position of the servant. This humble entry into Jerusalem was the beginning of the end of his life. And this king that we, we, we worship, this king did not receive a crown with precious stones, but a crown of thorns. His garment was not, not fine linen, but, but one full of blood and stripes from flogging. And while the people expected this king to bring death to their enemies, this king came and laid his life down and took death on himself so that we all can have life. See, this is the peace Jesus was referring to. Our need for reconciliation with God and with one another. Our need to be free from the power of sin and death. Jesus came as the king to deal with the very root of our human issue, our sin and our rebellion against God. And this is the peace that we all truly need. And that's why Jesus said, if only you knew. Oh, Jerusalem, if only you knew who I truly am. See, this moment right here happened when Jesus was, was crying over, walk, coming in on this donkey, this is the exact fulfillment, exact fulfillment of a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. If you go back to Daniel chapter 9, you're going to read and you calculate those days and weeks and all that. There are 483 years being prophesied from the moment where the decree will go out that the temple will be rebuilt to when the Messiah will come. And this was the exact moment that Jesus was entering if they knew, if they studied, if they really recognized it, they would know that this is the king. Yet they missed it. They missed why he had truly come. If they truly knew who he was as the Messiah, then they would have submitted to his kingship. The people did not know the time of visitation from God. See Luke 19 verse 44, it says here, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. There is a cost for rejecting Jesus. Friends, there is a cost for rejecting Him. What could have been a time of redemption for the people of God became now a time of judgment because they did not know the time of His visitation. So what does this mean for us? This means that Jesus is calling us today to submit to His kingship. Jesus is calling us to submit to His kingship. See, for the Jews, they were able to quote Messianic Psalms and proclaim Jesus as king, yet they still miss who he truly was as the king that they needed. And I wonder today if we have missed out on what it means to have Christ as our king, as the king. Have we accepted Jesus as king outwardly with our confession, yet internally we have rejected him in our hearts? Are we just going through the motion of, of being a, a Christian versus are we truly living in submission to the king? with our hearts and in our lives. Interestingly, Jesus, on the Sermon of the Mount, in Matthew and in Luke as well, that was recorded, Luke 6, 46 says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? See, Jesus himself said that ultimately, those who do not do what he says will be like a house that end up, ends up in ruin. And if you look at this statement of why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say, is Jesus practically telling us what you say and what you do doesn't match. You can say so much, you can profess and proclaim so many things, and yet you're not doing what I say. And He's telling us, how are you proclaiming me as king over your life? To what? Not just what you say, but what you do. What you do as well. So what does it mean for us to submit to Jesus as king? It means more than just avoiding the penalty of death. It is about embracing His kingship over our hearts and our lives. And doing the Word of God, what He calls us to do through His Word, more than just the things that we are asking Jesus to do for us, maybe the real question we need to ask is, how are we yielding our lives to submit to Him as our King? How are we yielding our lives to submit to Him as our King? How does this king rule over our hearts? How does this king rule over your thoughts? How does this king rule over your attitude, your behavior, your responses? How does this king rule in your life? It's one thing to profess and proclaim. It's another thing to allow him to rule in our lives. Friends, don't miss what Christ has done and what he's still doing in our lives today. What does Jesus the king say about my thoughts, my attitude, the way I treat others. 
What are the things that this king is concerned about? Does it concern me as well? Or am I just coming here, just taking away what speaks to me and not listening to what I need to obey? What concerns him has to concern me. Just like how Jesus wept over this city and was broken for the people because they did not know him and the destruction that followed along. Are we also then broken for those who have yet to come to know him? Does it affect us just as how much it affected Jesus for the lost? See friends, if we truly proclaim Jesus as king, then our lives must submit to his kingship. Our way of life must be one that reflects the kingdom of God on this earth. Not wait until you go to heaven, then, oh yeah, yeah, you're king. Right now, the kingdom of heaven is upon this earth. So how are we living, allowing the king of kings to rule our lives today? How are we submitting to his kingship? See, Jesus is the king that we need and we must submit to his kingship. You know, I started this message asking us to think about what we want. What exactly do we want in our lives? And to also contrast that and to consider what is our essential need? What exactly do we truly need in our lives? And the truth is this. To be honest, there is nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with what we want in our lives. There's nothing wrong for you to want that job or to want this thing or to want that grades or to want that cost. It's, it's fine. It's nothing wrong with that. Whether it's to get into the school that you want, the major that you want, the job progression that you're looking for, maybe some of us better health, more wealth. These are all good things. And, and while they may be good things, my challenge to us today is maybe we need to think a bit deeper into what we truly need instead. What do you and I truly need? Instead of the stuff we, we, we want, maybe God is saying, we need to know God more. To know Him deeper. Because you can have the best grades in life, but without God, without knowing God, what really is that? We can know, we, we, can, we can achieve different things, but without, without knowing Him, who are we? And maybe for some of us, if you're thinking about wanting that job or that better progression, maybe God is saying, instead of saying what you want, maybe you need to right now learn to trust in Him even when things are difficult. And maybe for others, if we are thinking about our health or, or our livelihoods or our future, maybe God is telling us right now we need to rest and to find hope and peace in Christ Jesus alone. Because the truth is, we're just one breath away from losing this life. Anytime, just one breath. So what you want versus what you need. And today, Jesus is the king that we need. Not the king that we expect him to be. He is the king that we need. And we need to submit to his kingship. Because it is his kingdom. This, is, this all belongs to him. And he is the king that we need. And Christ wants to rule our hearts. He wants to be the king over our hearts and our lives. And he's calling each one of us to submit to him today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to give us an opportunity to respond to God's Word. I'd like to speak to two groups of people. And the first group are those of us who will say today, I want Jesus to be my King. I want Him to be the King that I need, not who I expect Him to be. Maybe you're thinking about it. Maybe you've been the drive, in the driver's seat of your life for a while. Maybe some of us, we have approached Jesus as this practical problem solver. We expect Him to solve our problems on our own terms. But today, right now, you sense the Lord speaking to your heart that it is time to give Him that place and position as King over your life, over your heart, over your life, to entrust your life into His hands. Maybe some of you are going through something very difficult and you're crying out to Him today. Whatever the situation may be, today if you say, Jesus, I recognize you, as a king that I truly need. It's time for me to let you be the king of my life. If that is you across this room, just respond to him right now by raising your hands. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it and you can put it down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hands coming up behind. Thank you, at the back. The second group are those of us, as you're hearing about what Jesus said, if only you knew 
what will make for peace. If only you knew the peace that He wanted to offer. And this is for those of us who want to experience this true peace that Jesus came to offer. The Bible said that Jesus is the King that brings peace to the nations. More than just trying to experience peaceful moments in our lives, today you want to experience the peace that you truly need. The peace with God. The peace that remains regardless of the storms that we may face and experience in our life. Whatever that you're going through right now, Jesus is the King that we need. And today you want that true peace. You want a true peace that Christ came to give. If you say today, yes, I want that true peace, just lift up your hands right now across the space. Thank you. Thank you, hands going up. Thank you. The side, the back, the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next gen, can we all stand to our feet if you're able to? Let's rise to our feet. And as the worship team leads us in this song, I want to give us the opportunity to step out in faith, come forward, and respond to the Lord right now. If you lift up your hands or you haven't lifted and you want to come forward for prayer, just come to the front. Our team would love to pray with you. Take the next few moments to respond to God and let Him be the King over our lives. Come.